Hi, everyone. First of all, I would like to thank uh, Mohamed and Victor for organizing an amazing conference uh, and for including our paper in the program. I think it's very important to talk about the uh, big data in economic history, and it's great that we have two days uh, uh, in order to do that. So. Thank you so much. Uh, I know that organizing online conferences uh, requires even more work than in-person conferences. So great job, guys. So today I'm presenting my work on technology transfer and early industrial development, which is a joint work with Bully. And the motivation of this research is that the technology transfer is a key driver for economic development that has been uh, and in technology transfer intervention have been widely used to push industrialization in developing countries. Uh, moreover, uh, it has been argued that uh, the uh, foreign know-how diffusion is essential for the creation of industry-specific knowledge that can in turn allow the establishment and the expansion of specific industries. Despite the, the importance of technology transfer on economic development, little we know about its causal effect on industrialization, mostly because of lack of long-term data that are able to follow firms and countries involved in these policies over time, and because of lack of variation in, um, uh, uh, in uh, um, how these policies are delivered. So we think that there are two uh, major open questions about the long run and the spillovers effect of technology transfer, but also about disentangling the difference between the transfer of technology embedded in capital goods versus the transfer of foreign know-how. So to answer this question, we use evidence from a unique historical episode, which is the Sino-Soviet alliance an alliance between communist China and the Soviet Union that lasted between 1950 and 1963. It involved a bunch of different interventions, including, including a massive technology transfer program that aimed at the construction of the so-called 156 projects. That were technology that that uh, whose goal was the construction of technology advanced, large scale, capital intensive industry facilities. And the, the projects sponsored through this program could be of two types. Uh, the basic transfer that had the goal of duplicating whole Soviet plants, as well as transferring state-of-the-art machinery and equipment from Soviet Union to China. And then advanced transfer that on top of the basic transfer also included the training of Chinese engineers and technicians and technical assistance. Through this program that amounted for, to 45% of Chinese GDP in 1949, the country was able to receive the best technology available in, Soli in Soviet Union that in some specific industries like steel and iron was the best uh, in the world. So we collected data and uh, uh, on the, uh, the projects that were approved under the Sino-Soviet Alliance, we found out that the projects indeed were, were the projects that were eventually approved and signed were 139. And we match these projects with uh, the uh, performance of the plant built in them. We have yearly data for plants in the steel industry between 1949 and 2000, and firm level data in 1985 and between 1998 and 2013 in all the other industries. So in terms of uh, identification, what we exploit uh, is that uh, the, uh, uh, each project, uh, and more in general, the project uh, completion faced some idiosyncratic delays after they start, mostly due to the fact that the Soviet Union didn't have the capacity to provide machinery, all the machinery asked to China, as well as the personnel to provide technical assistance. And at the end of the 50s, the um, Sino-Soviet alliance went in turmoil. And uh, specifically in 1960, the technology transfer program was canceled. What, uh, uh, what this meant? Uh, it meant that projects that experienced fewer delays were completed before the split with the Soviet technology. And these will be our treated projects. While projects that experienced more delay that uh, weren't finished at the time of the split, and so they ended up being completed by China only using domestic technology. And we will refer to these projects as comparison projects. And we will show that they were very similar in terms of the observable characteristics, as well as the characteristic of the industry uh, and the geographical areas in which they were located. 
So in terms of the results, uh, what uh, we find is that technology transfer had the large and persistent effect on the performance on treated plant, we document an increase in both the output quantity and quality, and an average uh, productivity increase, uh, uh, productivity difference of uh, 22%, uh, 23%. We find that also these firms adopted uh, more technology, especially when China started to uh, gradually open up uh, to trade and employed better human capital. And in the long run, uh, in the late 90s, these firms had also more product diversification and innovation and engage in export to a larger extent. We also find that the advanced technology transfer, so receiving the Soviet machines and the training for uh, the um, um, high skill uh, technicians uh, further boost the plant performance. Uh, the effects were larger, more lasting. There was a larger technological upgrade due to the complementarities between human and physical capital. And finally, we document what the, the effects were in terms of local industrial development. And what we find is that the program generates substantial horizontal and vertical spillovers, larger for companies that locate close to plants that receive the uh, advanced transfer, while in the long run, the productivity gain seems to persist only for firms that became privately owned and there are economic related to treated plants. So either work in the same sector or in upstream downstream sectors of treated plants. And in order to explain these results, we look uh, at uh, some county level variables and specifically we document that in counties with, uh, um, in which uh, the uh, treated projects were located, the overall competition was high uh, between the late 90s and the early 2000s, as well, uh, there was a higher level of human capital. So in terms of a contribution to the literature, I think that this work contributes to the literature about the technological adoption and now know-how diffusion within and across countries. Uh, one key advantage of our setting is that we can exploit as good as random variation in the projects that were eventually completed with technology transfer, and we are able to compare them with projects that were still completed, but without a, um, technology transfer. Uh, and moreover, we are able to disentangle the effect of transferring physical capital with the higher technology uh, with the effect of uh, also transferring the know-how that is necessary to operate uh, these uh, machines. Uh, um, we also contribute to the literature about economic agglomeration and industrial cluster, estimating the long-run effect of the construction of large industrial facilities and to the uh, literature in terms of economic history, looking at the post-World War II technology transfer programs that were widely implemented both uh, in uh, the uh, um, uh, economies related to the United States, for instance, uh, Europe and Japan, and in the economies more related to Soviet Union, for instance, China, Eastern Europe and other um, uh, Southern East Asian countries. So the rest of the talk, we describe uh, the Soviet technology transfer, the data that we collected, our empirical strategy, our main results, the spillover uh, effects, and then some uh, conclusions. So to get started with uh, the um, um, Soviet technology transfer, when China, uh, when the, the, the People's Republic of China was founded in 1949 after 22 years of civil war, its economy was largely pre-modern. Uh, and so the um, um, Chinese official pressed hard uh, in order to get a technology transfer from the Soviet Union. This technology transfer that was part of a broader form of assistance between the Soviet Union and China involved the signature of several agreements between 1950 and 1957 for the construction of the so-called 166 projects, whose goal was building technologically advanced, large-scale capital-intensive industrial facilities. This program was massive. It accounted for 45% of Chinese GDP in 1949 and 144% of Chinese industrial production in 1949. Uh, the projects that the Soviet Union sponsors were, uh, sponsored were of two types. The first one were basic technology transfer that involved the duplication of all Soviet plants, the installation of state-of-the-art machinery and equipment, through which China had received the best technology in use in the Soviet Union, in iron and steel, some state-of-the-art machinery were installed in Chinese plants even before being used 
in Soviet Union, but there was also help in selecting plant sites, applying the design, and supervising construction of, uh, um, uh, of the plants. While uh, uh, other projects uh, uh, received the advanced technology transfer, so on top of the basic technology transfer, there was also training of Chinese personnel, uh, specifically engineers and high skilled technicians, uh, and the sharing of engineer design, product design, and other technical data. Despite the two countries were uh, um, depicting a, a, a picture of rosy uh, friendship, on the ground, the, the technology transfer program encountered many problems, as uh, most of the machinery, equipment, and design arrived to Chinese plants or start operation later than planned. There were many uh, um, examples um, that can explain the reasons of these delays, uh, some were related to constraints on the Soviet production capacity in the sense that machinery and equipment were in reserve, uh, were, were not available in reserve uh, in Soviet Union. And so, for instance, if some unexpected event in Soviet factories happen, then uh, there were some delays uh, or uh, um, even the block of some shipment to China because these machines were really needed uh, in, uh, um, in Soviet Union. Uh, moreover, the availability of human capital, like Soviet experts and also translators uh, that could visit Chinese plants, was very limited. Again, uh, we, uh, we have uh, uh, found some examples uh, of uh, teams supposed to go to uh, China that were redirected to some uh, Soviet plants uh, due to sudden breakdown that no one else could do, deal with. Uh, and also some uh, uh, cases in which the team, the, 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 the travel of the team to China was delayed because uh, the translator didn't make significant progress in learning Chinese and so they couldn't help uh, with the translation as much as it was needed. Some other problems depend on miscommunication between Soviet and Chinese experts. So there were some initial misunderstanding, long-term communication apparently didn't work well, there were some loss of correspondence. And so, for instance, some Soviet design didn't fit the characteristics of the land in which the, uh, uh, some plants uh, uh, had, to, uh, had to be built. Uh, of course, China was aware of these problems, but it was very hard to reallocate these limited resources towards the more uh, uh, promising projects. Uh, machinery and equipment were plant specific, also experts and translators were really trained to use specific machineries. Uh, and so uh, at the end, uh, um, uh, there was not that much that China could do in order to deal with these delays. In the same time, for political and ideological reasons, uh, the Sino-Soviet alliance uh, went in turmoil. Uh, although the, the diplomatic relationship between the two countries uh, formally continued until 1963, in 1960, the technology transfer program was canceled, in the sense that the Soviet Union stopped providing machinery and equipment and uh, withdrew its experts uh, that were in China. What were the implications for the program? So, 80 projects that experienced fewer, fewer delays were basically completed at the time of the split, and so they maintained the Soviet designed uh, machinery and equipment. While 59 projects that have not been completed yet, but for which the location and equipment was already uh, been chosen, were completed by China without any Soviet uh, technical assistance and so on, relying only on domestic technology. So in terms of the data, we collected the data on the projects that were approved uh, um, under uh, this program. We're talking about the 139 projects uh, that we have collected from the, the National Archives Administration of China. And uh, in order to perform our empirical analysis, uh, we uh, match this data with uh, uh, data of the steel industry that have annual report with the performance of the uh, 92 uh, firms, uh, steel in firms. Uh, that were in operation between 1949 and 2000 in China. In 1985 and between 1998 and 2013, we can match our plants with all the plants that are included in the um, uh, second industrial survey and uh, in uh, the China uh, industrial enterprise uh, database. And we complement this data with province or county level data from the statistical yearbooks for the years in which they are available. So in terms of empirical strategy, 
as I was saying, what we are exploiting uh, is uh, the idiosyncratic delays in project completion that emerge after this starts, and they were largely unplanned. Um, uh, due to which uh, projects that experienced fewer delays were completed with the Soviet technology before the split, and projects that experienced more delays were completed with domestic technology by China only without any support from Soviet Union. So in terms of the empirical specification, we are going to regress some uh, uh, firm performance uh, output of firm I in the sector S in county uh, C at time T on a dummy for uh, the, 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 the treatment that uh, uh, we define as being equal to one for, for um, the plants that receive the Soviet technology. We control for some initial uh, um, project characteristics and industry county year uh, fixed effect. Um, in terms of the identification assumption, what uh, uh, we need uh, to argue is that the delays that projects experience uh, were orthogonal to their characteristics uh, or potential to be uh, successful. And even though if it, it may be counterintuitive at the first sight, um, these delays really uh, were, were not really um, expected and emerged after the projects started. So if we compare the characteristics of the treated and the comparison projects, uh, we can see that they are extremely similar in terms of many characteristics. The number of firms supposed to receive an advance transfer, when these projects were uh, approved, when they were supposed to start, how long they were supposed uh, uh, to last, uh, the number of workers, uh, the investments uh, involved, the uh, different measure of distance from the borders uh, as a proxy for accessibility of the project per se. The major delay, the, the major difference that we observe is in delays that uh, uh, it's less than three years uh, uh, for a treated project and more than five years for comparison projects. We also check whether the government may have decided to prioritize uh, some specific industries that may be more important for economic development. But also in this case, we don't find uh, an association between belonging to a specific industry and the probability of receiving the treatment. And we do the same exercise by looking at the location of projects uh, at the province level and the smaller level of aggregation, and they all confirm our results. Um, as I was saying before, uh, a potential threat to our identification can come if uh, 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 the Chinese government uh, uh, was able to reallocate some machinery and personnel from treated to comparison projects. However, this is very unlikely to be happen. So first of all, we didn't find any evidence of capital good reallocation. And we think that this is because it would uh, have involved a significant slowdown in the completion and in the production of these projects that were the best project that China had available. Um, high skilled workers were employed, but only uh, locally. And as migration was highly restricted due to the UKU system, the registration system, we can also exclude that there was a large inflow of, uh, um, of workers between treated and comparison plants. We also propose an IV approach in which we instrument the delays uh, experienced by the projects, uh, sorry, in which we instrument the probability of being treated with the delays that project experienced, but I'm not showing these results today in the interest of time. So to get started with the first set of results, we find that receiving the technology, the Soviet technology transfer has a positive effect for the outcomes of treated firms. They increased their production of steel by 24%. They were 33% uh, more uh, productive. And if we look at the persistence of the effect, we can see that the effect on productivity, for instance, start being significant three years after the start of, uh, of the program and the effects uh, remain large and significant until uh, uh, the, 50, the end of our sample, so 50 years after this project actually started. We can also look at the composition of the steel produced, and we find that there is an increase in the production of high quality steel, that is the curd steel, and a decrease in the production of pig iron. Um, there is also an increase of steel produced with the furnace, um, open air furnace and oxygen metal that were considered state of the art in the 50s and 60s. But then later on in the 80s, these metals became old fashioned and they were replaced by the continuous casting. And we can see that after 1985, 
indeed treated the plants adopted more advanced technology and this was also recognized by the fact that they were exporting more um, steel that is above the international standard 50 percent more so it's also an international recognition of the quality of these plants and finally we find that uh, they increase the while the total number of workers is not the different between treated and comparison plants they were employing more engineers and more skilled technicians and consequently less um, 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 low uh, skill labor uh, the results between 1985 and 1998 2013 for all the firms basically confirm our results Treated firms have higher uh, uh, value added and the productivity, and also they are able to produce at lower cost, they have more uh, product variety, and systematically engage more in exports. Um, we can also, uh, given the feature of the program, disentangle the effect between the basic and the advanced technology transfer. So what is the effect of just receiving technology advanced machines versus receiving technological advanced machines and the training and the know-how needed to operate them? And what we find is that uh, receiving the uh, advanced transfer has additional um, a positive effect on firm performance. Uh, there is a 6% uh, increase in productivity, I find a 5 point, uh, um, uh, sorry, 6.9%, uh, sorry, 5.9% uh, increase in production additional to, to firms uh, that receive the basic transfer, 69, 6.9% 6 increase in productivity. Interestingly, some plants uh, that were supposed to receive the advanced transfer, but ended up receiving the basic transfer, did not have better performance, which is, uh, again, uh, um, an indication of how these delays were as good as random, but also as uh, the, the treatment is really driven the differences that we observe. And uh, uh, we also find that these firms uh, are mostly driven the results in terms of uh, high quality uh, uh, labor employment with a substantial higher number of engineers and technicians than firms that receive the basic transfer. The, the major goal of the technology transfer program was to create large industrial facilities that could push economic development, local economic development. And so in the, in the um, remaining part of uh, the paper, we look at whether it was the case. So first of all, we look at whether there were any agglomeration effects. So if firms uh, uh, either in the same industry or in upstream and downstream uh, uh, industries of the uh, treated and comparison uh, plants, we're more likely to locate uh, close to the, um, to the latter. And indeed, we find that it is the case. Uh, so there is a higher concentration of firms related to treated firms within 50 kilometers uh, of them, with an additional gain for, uh, uh, for being close to firms that receive uh, the advanced transfer, while we don't find anything going on beyond 50 kilometers or for firms in unrelated sectors. And then we investigate whether the program created any horizontal or vertical spillovers. So in terms of horizontal spillovers, the effect seems to uh, uh, be there, but only for firms that receive the advanced transfer. These firms are producing more and they are more productive than firms that are located either close to um, uh, firms that receive the basic transfer or firms that didn't get uh, any transfer. Well, in terms of vertical spillovers, we find that uh, uh, firms that are closer to treated plants are in general larger. And I think these are uh, explained by the fact that treated plants are producing more. And so they probably demand more from the uh, supplier and they uh, provide more inputs to um, their uh, downstream firms. So they produce more steel, they employ more workers, they use more inputs, but they are not necessarily more productive. While if uh, these firms are located close to firms uh, that receive an advanced transfer, we also find effects on productivity in the sense that there is an additional increase in the production of steel that is associated with an additional increase in terms of productivity. Um, in the late uh, 1990s, uh, um, uh, China started uh, um, a wave of uh, privatization and the number of institutional changes that uh, uh, market transition towards a more market-oriented economy. 
And so we wonder whether the technology transfer program interacted with these institutional change, changes that happen um, uh, uh, in, uh, in the late 90s. And specifically, we look at whether firms that were close to treated plants were still able to maintain their economic advantage uh, uh, in light of this uh, privatization. And what we find is that uh, firms that are close to treated plants uh, are more productive, are larger in size, um, they export more, only if they are close to a treated plant and become private between 1998 and 2013, which is the time period that our data cover, with an additional gain for new firms, for new entrants that uh, enter the market as private firms between uh, um, this, uh, uh, this time period. And so we wonder whether the technology transfer created some local conditions that may have interacted with uh, these uh, uh, important institutional changes. And specifically, we analyze two, um, um, two um, angles. The first one is competition. So as I was showing before, there were agglomeration effects in the sense that there was a higher number of firms that relate close to treated plants between uh, their opening and 1985. This Pilouris effect persisted in 1998 and 2013. There was on average 20% more firms located close to treated plants. And the higher fraction of these plants became private between 1998 and 2013. So at the county level, we document an increase in the um, uh, competition that uh, probably forced private firms to compete more and to become more productive uh, when uh, they could do, do that. We also look at what happened in terms of human capital, and we find that in treated counties, uh, there is a um, higher concentration of human capital in terms of college graduate and high skilled workers. And again, we think that this is an important factor uh, for explaining our long term results because when firms become private, they start competing for inputs. Uh, the registration system, the UCU system, was still in place, uh, even though it was lifted, uh, uh, gradually lifted, but was still in place for most of this period. So definitely having a higher level quality of human capital at the local level may have helped these firms in employing better workers with, uh, uh, consequently, uh, better economic performance. Okay, so I'm almost out of time, so let me just conclude and then uh, um, I look forward to uh, uh, discuss more with you. Uh, what we show in this paper is uh, uh, what, is, uh, the what are the long run effects uh, of technology transfer. We document that uh, large technology transfer program can have direct effect on the performance on treated plants that are highly persistent over time. They, and they can also create agglomeration effect and horizontal and vertical spillovers effect. And uh, uh, in, in the context of China that uh, started uh, uh, important privatization uh, campaign in the last uh, 30 years, so we also find a substantial reallocation from state-owned to privately-owned uh, firms. Um, the last question could be, what is the external validity and what are the policies implications that we can draw from this program? So first of all, technology transfer programs were widely used in the 50s and the 60s to promote industrialization of developing countries. Um, I think that the, uh, our work shows that uh, uh, technology transfer play an important role in the industrialization of these countries because the same results cannot be achieved by simply imitating foreign technology, even when some plans to imitate are available within the country. And I think that our results also underscore the importance on foreign on the job training and know-how diffusion to create uh, industry specific knowledge that can really allow these uh, uh, industries uh, to flourish and the effects to persist in the long run through more technological adoption and, uh, uh, and innovation. So uh, I'll um, stop here and uh, um, thank you very much for, uh, uh, for coming. Stop sharing. So if there is any questions.